All right, good morning. Welcome to Woodland Community Church on this sunny, spring-like morning. I talked to Brother Greg this week. His grandson in California played his first high school baseball games this past week. Again, I wonder why we're here sometimes. If you're a high school baseball player from Lake, 27 days until our first game, scheduled game. Coach Iverson says we're going to get in a van and drive south till we find a field uh, on March 26th. All right. Um, hey, I just have a really a couple quick announcements. This week is a game night for the ladies on Thursday night. That's uh, again, yes, yay. Uh, my son told me I should have worn like a sweat headband, and, like bring your competitive spirit, get ready for game night, ladies. Uh, Thursday night again. They would appreciate you to sign up at the table in the back just for planning purposes, but if you don't sign up, don't let that stop you from coming Thursday night if your schedule allows it. And then also one last reminder about those baby bottles. We think there's a few out there yet, and if uh, Wendy's not here today, but Rachel will take them, and Rachel's in the back. You want to give away, Rachel? There you go. If you have a baby bottle, that can go to Rachel today for the fundraiser for the Abiding Care Pregnancy Resource Center in Medford. All right, well, we're excited you're here today with us to worship and we'll turn it over to Dan and the clan. This morning our God is in control. Regardless of what the media says, he is in control today. So let's start with some good vertical worship. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great!
Michael, Brian, first one. Yes. We have, have a seat, everybody. Ah, uh, yes, we have Brian, if you can imagine that. And Larry, join me up here, Larry. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. During these, have a seat, Larry. This is the point in our service where we have <laughs> we have a conversation, and you know everybody joins us yes. in all of this. So, th during these winter months, we're taking some time to think about our team leader ministry. And as as we've said, we have nine team leaders, actually fewer than that, because a few people like Benke lead more than one team. Um, this morning, we are talking about adult ministries, the adult ministries team, which is a ministry that has grown faster and more prolifically than we ever thought it would when we organized the team leader structure about five years ago. So we, we've got a team here that's moving in lots of different directions, and um, just to to, to, to explain where we are here. The elders are about ready to talk about this team because we're going to have to figure out how to respond to what God is doing it, because this is really something. Tell us about the different, the four different ministries that have, that are under adult ministries and that are, that are doing things right now. It, it is, it is a eclectic collection. And <laughs> you got one of those kitchen drawers where, you know, everything just kind of goes there <laughs> that you don't know where everything else will go um, that's kind of a little bit like adult ministries and adult ministries is thriving uh, but thriving in lots of different ways uh, there's the women's ministry uh, they're meeting at Bedimulus now and mm. there's some I'm not 100% you're leading Susan you got the leadership on that and there's other things going on Amanda's kind of our key person for, for a women's ministry. And then there's men's ministry that meets a Thursday morning at the GYC. And that leadership gets passed around a little bit. And those guys are hanging out as guys talking about guy stuff on, on Thursday morning. Um, and that's working well. Um, there is a small groups ministry and that's uh, Tim Peterson. He was kind of coordinating that. He's been, he sat up here a few weeks ago and he kind of gave that overview. And then there's, we kind of put the, the uh, Sunday morning adult uh, classes in that. And right now we have one class uh, doing that, but we're open to new and different things of different opportunities we might have for adults on Sunday morning. But what we try to do in that class is um, we have some very articulate and insightful people that share lots of really good ideas. Um, and I mean the class members, uh, leadership, that kind of facilitate that is is uh, Norm does it once in a while, Todd does it once in a while, uh, Dick Hens has, has been in there, and so we just we we worship in thinking and talking. That's kind of what we do in that class. So we'd welcome anybody to join us. So that's kind of an overview of what's going on with adult sure. ministries. Put that all in one box now, yeah, Brian. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're kind of like a beehive that's yeah. growing and probably needs to be split and yeah. organize somehow, yeah. but the bees are doing the work, and in this case, the Lord is doing the work. Um, how, how can people get involved in one of these adult ministries sure. uh, groups, and, sure. then, and, then, and then how can we support what the Lord is doing here? Maybe two questions here. Sure. To, to get involved is one, just to come. Uh, join us on Sunday morning, men on Sunday, uh, on Thursdays in the women's group, certainly do that. Um, the, in terms of leadership, we, in the Sunday school area, we're passing that around. We'd be looking for other people if you'd like to lead a discussion and, and have some ideas on that. Uh, so that's an opportunity. Um, help me. What was the other question? How do people get involved? How, how can we support what the Lord is doing here? Well, how can we pray about it? Certainly, how can we certainly prayer. Um, that's definitely um, an avenue that we, that we all would pray for everyone that's doing ministry uh, at Woodland. Uh, so that is one way to get involved. Attend. Um, we're looking for somebody to kind of put this all together, but the elders are going to kind of work on talk that, about and, that. And, and talk about it's that. It's bigger than one person can put his or her mind right. around, right? Right. Okay. Hey, well, thanks for talking to me. 
Thank you. And there's a lot of ways to be involved in what the Lord is doing here uh, with adults at Woodland. And, and uh, let's, let's pray for this team. Father, thank you for all of our team leaders that you have raised up and for, for the teams that are in transition. Uh, there's a couple of them. And we, we thank you for being ahead of us and, and for leading us. And as in all of life, we need wisdom from you. Um, we need your, your grace to be patient and to watch and discern what you're doing. And we thank you for your work among adults here at Woodland, the men, the women, the small groups, um, the, the, the Sunday school that goes on here on Sunday morning. Some of these groups like our women's ministry, has more, they have more than one thing going on, uh, retreats and studies. And it's wonderful that such a small church in kind of an out of the way place would have this level of, of dynamic ministry. And we thank you. And we ask that you would lead us, give us the patience to see what you're doing and, and, and continue, Lord, we would beg you uh, to work in the hearts and minds of uh, our adults and our families here at Woodland. And we thank you for this morning and all that you're doing in it. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, we also uh, want to remember our missionaries on Sunday mornings here. And so this morning we are remembering Jana Horseth. She is our missionary out in Poland. And it's, uh, it's a good thing we have her to be praying for, especially during this time that we are living in. So a um, couple things that she wants us to be aware of and then also to support her in prayer with. Um, first off. Just continued patience as um, Poland is still under a lot of strict mandates, um, having to wear masks in public places and stuff like that. So just uh, perseverance. We are very fortunate that we live in a country that is lighting that up and we don't have to have that as much as a thing um, going on with in our lives still. And so let's pray for that. Um, also, tensions in Poland are rising with refugees flooding in. Um, the people of Poland, she said, are panic purchasing at the fuel stations, just getting as much gas as they can, which I'm sure is affecting just, just the morale. And so fear is spreading across the nation. She said, why doesn't faith spread at such a rapid at a pace? But um, just the people of Poland are really getting nervous and tepid about what, what's going to happen next and how this is all going to affect them. Um, and so prayer request she asked for us to just um, stand with her is to, to stand firm um, as believers, that they would stand firm in their faith and that they would uh, have a good witness um, as their nation goes through this. Asking God to raise up an English teacher for their summer camp and then campers for that. And then also um, she's just asking that God would give her creativity and inspiration as she prepares a hand mime for their Easter service. And so, um, so let's be praying for Jana. And so that reminds us that we should also be praying for the nation of Ukraine as well. Um, that's just the witness of the church during this time of turmoil. Um, and then just, just for world leaders, that God would give them wisdom as they decide how to respond rightly to this situation um, that's, that's rising and with our, with our um, neighbors out there in the European um, Eastern nations. So the, the lots of things going on in our country, in our nation, um, for Jana that we can pr be praying for. And lastly, I want to mention where we're at with our youth missions trip this summer. It's been a roller coaster of a week. I put out an email to tell, tell the parents saying, hey, because we haven't had enough students, uh, we're going to have to cancel because it seems like there's not enough to do this. And uh, Students are doing other things this summer, which is great. We're sending lots of students to camp to do missions at camp this summer, so let's praise God for that. And as soon as I send that email click, I get a phone calls coming in, and uh, we have a few more students who said, wait, wait, hold off. We want to do this. And so 
Now we have eight students who have committed to the trip, and so we are going to go ahead and carry on and do the trip this summer. And so, um, yeah, praising the Lord for that. And so look for opportunities. A lot of these students didn't, weren't sure if they could go because of the money, and I just kept on encouraging them. God does not have limited resources. He, he will provide uh, when, he, when he calls you. And so if you feel like you're being called to that, be, be confident that he's going to provide. And so I know that as a local church, we can be an answer to those students' prayers and their concerns about the money. And so be looking for different ways that you guys can support. I know that they'll be probably sending out letters to different ones of you, and then we'll be putting on some, some fundraisers as well. So be praying for that group of students, um, that, that this, this journey. It's not just one trip. We're going to be meeting seven times before we even go on the trip. And so it's really a discipleship um, opportunity for these students. So be praying for their hearts in this opportunity. So let's, let's go ahead and go to the Lord with all this that we have on our hearts and minds this morning. Father, we thank you for being a God who sees all things as involved in every little thing and every big thing that's going on in our lives and the lives of those around us and across the globe, Lord. So we do want to pray for Jana, Lord, that you would just give her courage and patience and perseverance as she continues to minister to the people of Poland, especially during this time, Lord. May your word be so much more relevant and, and, and just powerful as the people of Poland are, are just uh, filled with fear and anxiety and uh, questions about the future and what's going to happen, Lord, as, as a hearing of bombings just across the border, Lord, um, Lord that, that your peace would invade your people over there and that your witness would be made great um, um, in, in the people of, of God that you have there in Poland. So, Lord, just pray for Jana. Um, give her creativity and, and inspiration as she prepares for the Easter service and the creative way of presenting the great story and truth that you've risen from dead to life and now um, you are you are on the throne, Lord. Um, provide for the summer camp with the staff and just the campers, Lord. Um, just pray for all all that all that's going on in her ministry. Just ask that you would sustain her. We do pray for just uh, Ukraine. The church in Ukraine, Lord, protect your people, sustain them, and Lord, may their faith grow and shine in a time of darkness and, and fear and, and trembling, Lord. And um, we just pray that uh, you would you'd grant wisdom and discernment for uh, world leaders as they respond to this, Lord. And we do thank you for, for uh, raising up just in the nick of time enough students to be able to go on this mission trip and just ask that, Lord, you would show yourself faithful and powerful to these students that this, this trip would be not something that they, they do because their friends are going or, or, or because they, they feel like it would be an exciting, fun thing, but, Lord, because they have a desire to, to see you at work and to be used of you in, in a mighty way in a, in a different situation where they're pulled out of their comfort zone and, and grown and stretched, Lord. And so I just pray. Uh, that you would go before us, go before this group, and, and do something mighty through it. And we trust you for that. Lord, we give this morning to you. ask that you would invade our hearts with your grace and your love, your truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My goodness, we have a lot of reasons to uh, be concerned today, don't we? It, and it seems like once we get uh, through one thing, Another thing starts. Have you noticed that? It's no wonder that Eeyore's favorite place to look was the ground. Like, it's just, it's hard. It's hard. And the ground uh, doesn't always throw something back at you like when you're looking up and out. Um, <clears throat> we're going to do an exercise here. It's called worship. Um, and in this exercise, uh, we are going to we are going to fight against our hearts and our tendency to stare at the ground when things get hard, and we're going to look up and we're going to look out. Uh, because we know who is there and who's in control. Um, that doesn't make it easier all the time, but he's so good. Uh, it, is, it is a good expectation to expect to hear from God when things are hard, when you're in a foreign land. It's a good expectation. We should spend time in that truth today to expect to hear from God. Um, so would you stand with us? And it's going to get loud. 
Mark Batterson has written a few books, and he says something to this extent. He says, next time you want to take your troubles to God, consider taking your God to your troubles.
shall come with trumpet sound. like to um, bring a new song to Woodland, um, whether it continues to be sung or not, that's okay. But today it's appropriate, uh, and Joanna is going to teach it to us. Um, it's not a new song, it's an, it's an older song, not like a hymn, but like in the last, you know, 10 years ago maybe. Uh, but it's maybe a song you've never heard, and the chorus is simple. So you'll, you'll pick it up really quickly. It goes, Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. Your love is, your love is, your love is strong. recognize a lot of the words. Some of you grew up saying these words over and over and over. Uh, so be refreshed with these words.
just love strong? This was a week in uh, which my prayers were centered on what God is doing in the near place and then in the far place. And before we, we go to the passage this morning, we want to acknowledge and uh, pray for um, Daniel and Hannah Petka. As many of you know, uh, they lost their baby at 38 weeks. And uh, I know God will heal them. I, I, I know God will heal them. Um, my, my prayer for them, and, and our prayer, can, this can be our prayer for them, is that as, as the hours become days and the days become weeks and the weeks become months, they would know how to walk with God during this time and that they would know that God is strong and his love is strong. Uh, our, our church is preparing a response. Uh, we're, we're, we're still talking about this, but sometime during this week, you'll get an email that will we'll talk about how we can respond to Daniel and, and Hannah's need. And, and I've assured them that we're going to be praying for them this morning. So that's that's... That's the near thing, and then in the, in the, the far thing, it, it is our brothers and sisters in, in Ukraine. It is a, a place dear to me. I've been there a couple of times and have friends there, and uh, there are some tough brothers and sisters, and they've been through an awful lot. Um, at least the grandparents of the kids now who are in the middle of this have been through an awful lot and, um, and, and, and I pray for them as well that they would know that God's love is strong and that they would know how to respond in their own particular cultural moment. So let's, let's go to the Lord and, uh, and let's further commit the service to him and the reading of his word to him and our brothers and sisters to him, beginning with Daniel and, and Hannah. Lord, we pray this morning for the Petka family, Pat, Karen, Daniel, Hannah. We know you are with them. We know you are walking with them. And they are hanging on to um, the horns of the altar, so to speak, with your, your, your love and your sovereignty both at work at the same time. And we would ask, Lord, that as you grow them through this, that um, they would know your presence. Would you help them, Lord? And then looking to distant horizons, we pray for your brothers and sisters in what, what seems like the faraway place of Ukraine as the fighting goes on there. We pray that your church would know how to respond. And these are those who have stood and acknowledged you in the face of tyrants before. They know about living under godless leaders, godless rulers, we'll say. And we ask that you would give them strength and that you would help us to know how to respond and support them. And our passage is just about, it's just about this, Lord. It's, it's about expecting to hear from you. And, and I would ask that they would hear from you and that Daniel and Hannah would hear from you and that we would hear from you. And what am I saying? We have heard from you in Jesus and in your word. Um, help us. Help us to know it rightly. Help us to come to you rightly. Jesus, in our own cultural moment, we thank you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. 
Join me, if you would, in Daniel chapter 2. We're on the, the second half of this passage in this riveting book that will teach us, if we read it rightly, the end from the beginning. It'll show us God's big plan of what, what he's doing in the ages, and it'll help us not to be angry or afraid or confused when really bad things happen. We'll be in Daniel 25 to the end of the chapter, which is verse 49. We'll read that in just a second. Daniel is about how the kingdom of God overcomes the kingdoms of this world. About how the, the kingdom of God crushes, in fact, as, we, as we'll see today, the kingdoms of this world. And it's about how God's people should live in a foreign land while we watch God tie it all up and bring it to a glorious close in the return of Christ. And that's only the beginning of eternity and something we can really look forward to. In our passage, Israel is subject to a godless ruler. Uh, I... I Cease, I, I hesitate to call him a leader because he's not a leader after God's own heart. He's a, he is a, a ruler. This is King Nebuchadnezzar. And Israel is in a foreign land. And we, we have a map up here. And I found my pointer. So I'm so excited to use it. And we have a new map that's in English. And here, here ah, see, things are as they ought to be. There's Jerusalem down here. And you have Nineveh up here that has just ceased to be. So this is kind of a composite map. All, not all these places existed at the same time. But you have Nineveh up here in what would today be northern Iraq, uh, Syria being, being here. And then Israel has been deported and taken down to Babylon. This is the Tigris. This is the Euphrates. So those are the two main rivers in that part of the world. Uh, Susa over here is going to be part of, in eventually here before Daniel is over, part of the kingdom of Persia. The Medes are over there somewhere. Babylon, you see, is strategically located between the Tigris and Euphrates. So you can imagine that's a pretty fertile place to live in terms of growing things. And there's no accident that Babylon... Babylon is there, and that would today be the region around Mosul that we hear about in the news, uh, uh, the city in Iraq, and that is where Israel is. So if you can keep that map fixed in your mind. In our passage, the godless ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, has just had a dream. In fact, it's the same dream that he has over and over and over again. He might have had it once, and he thought, huh, a dream. And then he had it twice. Huh, eh, same dream, three times. Now he can't sleep, four times. He's wandering around looking for some God that will help him understand this dream. He thinks it has significance, five times. Now he thinks that the dream might be about him. And, and pretty soon he's, he's coming undone from sleeplessness and agitation. And, and he uses this dream to try to transcend the material world. In other words, he, he wants to try to figure out what's going, what's going to happen so he can get involved, so he can preempt what the gods are, 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 are going to do. He wants to, to play, play ball with the gods, so to speak. And at the same time, he wants to use it to eliminate his enemy. So Nebuchadnezzar is a complicated guy. And he summons his court magicians... His, his uh, magi, his wise men, his sorcerers, basically. And he demands to know the interpretation of the dream, but he doesn't just want to know what it means. He wants them to prove to him that they know what they're talking about. And he says, don't just tell me the interpretation. Tell me the dream itself. I'm not going to tell you what I've been dreaming. Tell me what I've been dreaming. And the reasoning goes that if you can tell me the future then you can certainly reconstruct the past. And if you can, you'll be blessed. And if you can't, you'll be cursed. How like a god Nebuchadnezzar is acting. 
and he certainly wants to do business with the gods here. And, and we see what's happening already this early in the book. This godless ruler who is drunk with absolute power becomes subject to paranoia. And he begins to evidence signs of insanity already early in the book. And the, the pattern here is that when a creature raises his hand to his creator, he becomes disconnected from reality and eventually will show signs of mental instability. And Vladimir Putin, we're looking at you. And we can see in the coming months as this crisis develops, we're going to see more and more erratic behavior coming out of a tyrant who believes that he has absolute power. Well, Daniel responds by making an appointment with the king. I, I just love this. Daniel doesn't know the dream. At this point early in chapter 2, he, he hasn't seen the dream. God hasn't revealed it to him yet, and yet he expects to hear from God. And so even while they're trying to kill him and all the other magi, wise men, he says, take me to the king, and he trusts that God is going to reveal the dream to him. And we learn here that we can expect to hear from God when you're threatened in a foreign land. And Daniel does hear from God. We read this in last week's passage. Then Daniel went into his house, and he made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning the, this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. And then the mystery was, was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And Daniel knows what it's all about. And he has what he needs to go in and talk to the king. And, and that's what we're going to read about in our passage today. So read along. We're going to read the whole thing this time. The whole thing beginning in verse 25. Then Arioch, so that's the, the king's uh, henchman, his hitman, then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came the thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me... This mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I, that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces." Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image 
became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be, divide, to be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it. Just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so shall the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Boom. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. What a passage! In this passage, we see the, the preparation to hear the dream. We see the, the dream. We see the interpretation of the dream. And we see the response to the dream. Let's take a look at it in, in detail. As Daniel has heard from the Lord. Notice how Daniel has favor with Arioch. This all goes back to what happened in the, the last couple of passages where Daniel prayed for favor, and in fact, God had told his people that they should seek favor in the land in which they're going to go, and, and look at how Daniel has favor. He has reasoned with his executioner, and God has blessed it. What's in it for Arioch here? He could just kill all the magi, the wise men, the sorcerers, including Daniel and his friends, and be okay with the king. But God has so turned his heart that he's willing to put his own head in the noose. I mean, if Daniel goes in there and makes a fool of him, then Arioch's going to die too. We're dealing with a very unstable king. But Arioch says, I'll do it. And he makes an appointment, takes Daniel in. He took a chance on Daniel. Notice how Daniel gives credit to God. Nebuchadnezzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen in its interpretation? Daniel says, no wise men, enchanters, magician, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked for. But there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king what will be in the latter days. Remember what the wise men said last week. When they couldn't produce the dream and its interpretation, 
This is from verse 11. The, the wise men said, the thing that the king asks is, is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with men. And Daniel is basically saying, they're right. Nobody can show you the interpretation except God, but they're also wrong. These, this God is not inaccessible. I know this God and I can introduce you to the great God most high. He's not clouded in mystery, but he untangles mysteries. And I, I love how we see here how clear-headed Christ followers in our time can speak to the anger, fear, and confusion of people around us when they're scared at crises going on in our day. I know the God of heaven. He's already spoken. Let me introduce you to him. Then Daniel reveals the purpose of the dream. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that, number one, the interpretation may be known to the king. God wants to show himself to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar can, can meet this great God most high. And then number two, that you may know the thoughts of your own mind. Nebuchadnezzar's mind is beginning to come undone here, which shows us what happens when somebody puts himself in the place of God and he's going to begin to lose track of ultimate reality and the ultimate reality of what God is doing. Daniel is saying, you have a chance to conform your mind to what God has revealed and to his purpose, and then your mind will work. It won't become undone. And, and I, just, I just love this for where we're at in the world. When we look at world events, we don't have to be undone. We don't, we don't have to be angry, afraid, or even confused because God has revealed the end from the beginning. We just have to walk with God and ask for mercy to live in a foreign land as we press toward the return of Christ. Daniel is so encouraging. Then we get the revelation of the dream. This is verses 34 to 35. And Daniel simply lays out what the king has seen in his own mind, which must have been just amazing to the king. He, he reveals a bright and frightening man. That's important. Is it a statue? Yes. But it's a statue in the image of man. This is noteworthy because typically when, when the ancients made idols, they made the idol in the, the form of whatever god they were trying to access. So they would say, ah, you know, the golden calf or whatever. You know, they, they, we're trying to get to that god. So we think that god looks like this. But this, this idol is in the form of man. It's not a depiction of God. It's a depiction of man. And yet it's an, it's an image that we'll see next week. Nebuchadnezzar decides needs to be worshipped. It has a gold head. It has a, a silver midsection. It has a bronze belly. It has, an, it has iron legs. And then it has feet made up of this sort of iron clay alloy mixture. I have this feature on my, my phone called live. You can take a picture and then you turn live on and it kind of animates the picture. You know, it's basically a, a still image, but then it adds kind of an animation feature to it. I always turn it off because I think it just takes lots of memory. This is a dream that takes up some memory. He's got a picture and then there's like this there's this activity that kind of moves it a little bit like, like a video. So he sees the, the statue of a, a man, and then he sees a stone that is cut out by no human hands. Remember that phrase. And the stone comes, and it strikes the feet of the statue, and then the man is crushed. The feet are crushed, they come apart, 
the whole thing falls around, falls down, and breaks apart, and then disappears like chaff, and then the stone grows and becomes a great mountain and fills the earth. So that's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has dreamed. Daniel's just told him the dream. Who could make that up, right? And David, oh, Nebuchadnezzar is like, you must be, you must be in with the gods. Because not only have you told me what the dream is, but now you, now you should be able to tell me what's about to happen. So he's listening. Can you imagine this? Then there's the interpretation of the dream. The, the interpretation is about the kingdom order of man, or what we might call the kingdom of man, and, and it's led by Nebuchadnezzar. You remember Adam. You remember Adam, right? Genesis 1. Adam was and is a real person, but he's also a type of leader. He's a type of ruler who was given dominion. Back in Genesis 1, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God tells Adam, you have dominion. You're the leader of, 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 this, uh, of this people, my image bearers, that's us, who are to have dominion and rule the earth. Notice how similar the language is here for Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel tells him, You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you ruler of them all. God has made Nebuchadnezzar the, the head of this order that is given dominion for a time. Really interesting to me, this, this phrase, most high, is used 13 times in the book of Daniel. Now, typically, you know, throughout, the, you know, most high refers to God. He is God most high. But seven of these times in Daniel that, that expression is used of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of an order. He's the head of the kingdom of man. And he has been exalted by God to his position for a time. The kingdom order of man is then going to produce other kingdoms in the same order. Very important, though. Watch how the kingdoms that come after Nebuchadnezzar deteriorate. Gold is replaced by silver, is replaced by bronze, is replaced by iron, which is strong. And at the end, it's going to be replaced by iron mixed with clay, which has the appearance of strength, but which proves to be very brittle and not strong. These kingdoms are what are to be. They're in the future from the time of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. That's verse 29. They're what is to be, and they are what is going to make up history. It's really interesting to me that, that human history is not really about progress. We think everything is about progress. I mean, this week I've heard so much like, how could such a thing happen in the year 2022? We've progressed so far. And it's true, we avoid some wars, we cure some diseases, we drill some wells, find some water for some people, we develop some vaccines and we visit other planets and we engineer computers and cars and all sorts of satellites and stuff like this. We harness natural energy to utilize, or we, we harness nature to utilize natural energy, although we can't make energy. But human history is really about man's rebellion against God and what God has done about it. That's the theme of the whole Bible, isn't it? Our rebellion against God and what God has done about it. And ultimate reality is conforming our minds to who God is, which is revealed in the Scripture. And when we do that, we'll know our own 
minds. Somebody asked J.R.R. Tolkien once about what the theme of his saga, The Lord of the Rings, is. And I, I love what he says because he was talking about the decline of the West, which I think is the theme of The Lord of the Rings. And he said, I am a Christian so that I do not expect history to be anything but a long defeat, though it contains, and in a legend may contain more clearly and movingly, he wrote fantasy after all, some samples or glimpses a final victory. But in other words, we're going down. We're not going up, despite what we might think. The kingdom order of man will not stand. Notice also how the statue is top heavy. And it's when it's when the feet are hit, it falls over and it's crushed. This statue, in the dream, in contrast to the stone that's going to come, is made by human hands. That is, in the likeness of man. It's not made like the stone, which is made without human hands. And we have verse 44, which I think may be the theme of the whole book of Daniel. I haven't decided yet, but I think this is the theme. And it says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. And that that verse and Daniel chapter 2 are really a microcosm of the whole book of Daniel. and, And really the whole story of redemption that God is taking his people through. What do you think Nebuchadnezzar was thinking at this point? I I, I don't know that he knew what to think. On the one hand, if he's really listening, he may hear this to say, oh, you're going to survive. Everybody after you is going to crash. And so maybe he's happy. How like a tyrant to think like that. But, but look, look at what Daniel, what Nebuchadnezzar does. He worships Daniel, right? This is the wrong answer, right? He, he worships the wrong person. He's, he falls down in front of Daniel, pays homage to him because he thinks he's found somebody who works for him who can manipulate the spirit world. So he's, he's pretty happy about this. And yet he acknowledges the God of heaven. Truly your God is God of God's. And Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. So far, the king has gotten what he wants, but the condition of his heart is yet unrevealed. What he's going to do with this, we'll have to wait till next, till next week to see. But the king exalts Daniel, and then he appoints God's people to positions of influence, which puts the Hebrews in a very dangerous position because now they're working for a very unstable, godless ruler, and only God knows what's going to happen. And yet, they're in the safest place available, right? Because they're right at the heart of, where, of what God is doing and where God has put them. So that's where we stand in the passage. And this passage is going to get unpacked throughout the rest of the book as we see what God is going to do for his people and what it's going to be like living in these subsequent kingdoms that are revealed here in the, in the, in the story, in the account. I have three takeaways from this passage, and they're, they're questions what do we learn from the statue? What are the, what are the principles here? Well, first of all, God gives rulers their power for a time and for his purposes. You know, we don't have to look at, at the war right now and say, well, this has just gone crazy. I mean, this shouldn't be happening. Oh, God is doing something 
in Russia, in Ukraine, in the world, and he has raised up leaders to accomplish his will, and we can rest in that. He also removes power from rulers when he's ready. He's going to remove Vladimir Putin when he's ready, and in his time, that kingdom is not going to last. And he's in control of history, and he's in control of the future. Man's power is strong, but brittle. And you can kind of see this in our world economy. I read an article this week about how uh, Germany really can't do anything right now because they've gone so green that they can't produce enough energy for themselves, so they get 50% of their energy from Russia. Right? Where has that put them right now? Not in a very good place. But it also affects Pastor Brian, because when I drive my Jeep to the Senex and Rib Lake, the number on the sign has something to do with this relationship. It's all connected in the kingdom of man. It appears strong, but it's really very brittle. So these are some lessons that we can learn from the statue. Second question is really the most important one in the whole passage. What is the stone cut out by no human hand? What is this stone all about? There, there's a special phrase here, made without hands. This is not the only place where this is used. In fact, it's used a whole bunch in the New Testament, and it refers to something only God can do. Listen to Hebrews 9.24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. In other words, when Jesus came, he didn't, he didn't enter in, into the tabernacle that was in the wilderness. He, didn't, he did go into the temple, but that's not where he did his work. In fact, when he died and rose again, he went into the very presence of God in heaven and he makes intercession for us. Heaven is not made with human hands. It's not from the kingdom of man. It's not from that order. And this stone doesn't come from anything that we have made. Second observation, the image of the stone is not new. We see it throughout Scripture, and it's going to crush God's enemies and build up God's people. Uh, we see it in Isaiah 28, which is quoted at least three places in the New Testament. Behold, I am the one who was laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, and a, 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 of a sure foundation. So it's not just a stone that comes and destroys, it's a stone that builds up. And then Jesus talks about this stone in relation to his ministry, as well as in relation to some people who didn't want to follow him. What did Jesus say? Luke 20, what then is this that is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's Isaiah 28. And everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Sounds an awful lot like Daniel 2, doesn't it? And then Paul in Acts 4 talks about the stone in relation to Jesus. This is what Paul says. This Jesus, sorry, that must be Peter, Acts 4. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So here we are deep in the Old Testament with Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar and this pagan king, and you get this, this picture of a stone that's going to be developed throughout Scripture and as we move along, we're going to meet Jesus. And we're going to see that what God is doing, and what he said he's going to do all along, has everything to do with Jesus, who's going to come back 
And he's not going to come back to campaign. He's going to come back to take over. Praise God. And we're being built up from the minute we trust in Jesus and are knit together as one people in him. When do I need this passage? Daniel 2. I mean, it's different, right? I mean, I don't think about stuff like this every day. When do I need this? Well, I, I need it when things are going great. When I'm participating in the economy of this world, and I think I've got it figured out, and I'm working hard in my job, and I'm getting promoted, and there's enough money in the bank, and I'm, I'm buying what I need, uh, I need to remember that, that all of my prosperity is from God. And if I forget him, I'm going to lose touch with reality. I'm going to become untethered and become more like the king than like Daniel. I need to remember this passage when things are good. And then I need to remember this passage when things are bad. That Jesus is coming back. That, I, that even when I live in a foreign land, under rulers and leaders who don't acknowledge him, I know the end from the beginning. That I'm square with ultimate reality. Jesus is coming back. I don't need to be afraid. And I don't need to be confused. And I don't need to be angry at what I see going on around me. That's Jan Daniel chapter 2. Fascinating, isn't it? We're going to pick up next week and check in with the king's mind. What is going on with this king? What does he do? And how does God's people respond? Lord, thank you. Thank you for helping us in our moment and, and giving us the big picture about what you're doing. Don't have to be angry. Don't have to be afraid. Don't have to be confused. And we thank you for helping us and helping us to be people who can make sense of reality from your word. And we help people who are so scared around us. Help us, Lord, as we serve you. We can expect to hear from you in a foreign land, and we have. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.
children of God say, amen. The morning isn't over. We have uh, time to, to encourage each other and fellowship with each other. We have classes about to start. I think we're going to turn this room over here, aren't we? Yeah, let's do that, yeah. And you are still the, the light of the world because God made you so. So be a city on a hill when everything else seems dark and falling apart. In Jesus' name, amen.